Dr. Eisenberger, you're a physicist who's been working in the field of energy and planetary systems for over five decades. You teach the carbon cycle and Earth-human interactions courses at the Columbia University and you've made a possibly life-saving, world-saving invention in the last decade which then has led you to forming the Alcos Institute which is dedicated to solving humanity's problems in an equitable way. So now while people generally believe that climate change is a devastating threat to humanity, you've been saying that we should turn the threat into an opportunity. Why would you state the opposite of common belief? Well certainly climate change is a threat and is a scary matter if we don't address it. However, my view is that the fact that we're uh, uh, having, creating climate change is a result of our successful use of energy to improve the life of, of the human species on the planet. And therefore, it is a, at the same time a potential threat, but also an indication of our successful use of knowledge and technology to really improve the human condition. And so what I say is, if we figure out how to use energy smarter, then we can turn that threat into an opportunity to create a sustainable future where we can even have more energy and improve, continue to improve the human condition for many people who don't have enough energy today. Mm -hmm. So when we're now looking at our planet as a system, we see two basic facts. One is that all elements are existent in a limited amount. And the other is that the energy keeps coming in from the sun on a daily basis. Would you agree that these two facts lead us to the following conclusion? One, energy should be, energy supply should be abundant for humanity in the future. And the other one is that we need to be treating all elements, including carbon. Circular, right. right. Uh, let me just point out to you, uh, the, the one thing that uh, I just want to make clear, I believe this century you will see in the next 10 or 20 years the, the, the ultimate energy source, which is fusion, right? That's, the sun creates its energy that it transmits from up there through fusion reactions on its planet. If we can control that reaction here on the planet, we are really in a completely different business because that is truly an unlimited amount of energy and it's a, it's, it's a very clean source of energy. It, it doesn't have any, any bad byproducts at all. And so it's an ideal energy source. So with that ideal energy source, uh, all the other tech, I mean, we still can do it with the sun indirectly or the wind, all those renewable sources. But in the end, fusion is going to make it happen. And once you have fusion or you have a renewable energy, all the rest of, as I said, all the rest of the knowledge of how you use that energy to make hydrogen, to make liquid fuels, to make carbon negative materials, uh, to make uh, free carbon free electricity. It's all there. Now you've made an invention, a technology that draws the CO2 directly out of the atmosphere and does it so in an efficient enough manner that it could actually help us combat climate change. Could you explain a little bit more about this technology? The basic idea behind capturing the CO2 from the air because we've put too much in there and the UN and all the experts have now recognized that to address the threat of climate change we have to remove CO2 that we've already put in the atmosphere. And that's the reason we formed a company, Global Thermostat. And the, this in simple terms, there's a material called the sorbent that has a particular attraction for CO2. So when the CO2 molecule gets to it, it binds it. And so what we have developed the technology for passing air efficiently or, and over this sorbent, have the CO2 get connected to it, and then once that sorbent gets loaded up with CO2, we move it to a place where we heat it up and we evaporate the CO2 and collect it, and then we either turn it into valuable products or stick it underground. In biology, the balancing out of the carbon in the atmosphere and in the ground is called the carbon cycle. What would you think is the best carbon cycle for us and for our planet? In one simple sentence, the, the ideal carbon cycle is one that is closed. 
right? And what happens is that that means we take the human plus the natural carbon that's going around, going into the atmosphere and coming back out in the atmosphere and being absorbed by the plants and the animals, sticks on the ground, and you want to balance those out, right? If we're able to balance those out so that the carbon cycle is closed, it doesn't, have, have, it doesn't either put more in the atmosphere or put more in the ground, what we will have done then is stabilize the climate. And the interesting thing that most people don't appreciate is even without climate change created by CO2, there's a natural climate change created by the sun on a much longer time frame, 10, 20,000 years, right? But, uh, uh, but on those time scales, New York has been under ice many times before, one mile high ice. And so our machine, once we solve the short-term problem, right, will have the ability to avoid some of the longer-term problems created by the natural system, because instead of balancing ourselves out, we're gonna end up balancing the natural system in its variations out on a much longer time frame. Is closing the carbon cycle going to be manageable for us? It's definitely, you know, our units are roughly the size of a truck or a car. And uh, to clean up the climate, you'd have to have 30, 40 million of them. And we make each year in this planet now, 73 million new automobiles. So we certainly have the capacity to make our machines at the scale that's needed. And that's why it's our successful use of energy that's given us this manufacturing capability. It's our successful use of energy that's enabled, that's created a climate problem in the first place, but it's that same capability if instead of making cars, we make, uh, not instead of, but in addition to making cars, you make our machines, we have the capability to do it, we have the industrial might to do it. You know, if, if you think about the vaccine uh, approach, uh, we do have the, just like they've rolled out and had the ability in pharmaceutical industry to make vaccines at a large scale fairly quickly. If we uh, orient our industrial energy industry might, we can roll out uh, the needed capacity very quickly. It seems that climate change in general often gets treated as an isolated problem. While you keep pointing out that energy supply and climate change are deeply intertwined, could you explain a little bit more about the connection of the two? I was definitely aware of it day one when I they were getting captured, but I certainly was not aware of it for a lot, of, a lot of my life. I really became very aware of it back in the 80s when we, had a, when we thought we were running out of oil, and I joined Exxon's research organization to try to find alternative energy sources to replace oil that, believe it or not, <laughs> it's hard to believe, we actually thought we were running out of it back in the 80s. That's why I became mm -hmm. very much aware of the role of energy and its connection to our needs and, and stuff. But also I want to always be sure to recognize this is a very uneven situation at this moment in terms of energy availability and energy poverty and there's enormous inequity in the progress that's been made. And that's why I, I'm always stressed firsthand, uh, especially my, when I teach my, uh, talk to students about energy, that the first thing one has to do is to really be concerned about using it in a way to uh, alleviate poverty because you can't expect a person who can't feed their children to be concerned about the climate or concerned about anything about being a global citizen. And so it's very important that one recognizes that the, almost at the same level of, of climate change threat is the providing of energy. And one of the interesting things about that, it's the failure to understand that that has resulted in the failure of the world to come together on an, a climate solution. Your invention being so important in terms of climate risk management, how do you ensure that it's getting distributed equitably and at the appropriate speed? We give no exclusive licenses and we're dedicated to maximizing the rate at which our technology gets implemented, not maximizing the short-term return or profitability of it. And that's what we believe. And also, my partner and I have recognized from the beginning that this uh, lack of uh, energy equity, if you want to call it that, or uh, 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 quality of life equity, uh, 
and lots of other stuff goes along with that. So we want to make sure that our technology is used equitably and make sure the developing countries and world get access to it and get access to it in a way that enriches them and doesn't repeat some of the, uh, con some of the consequences of colonialism or, or the natural resource economy where the, the, uh, the natural resources were in the developing countries and they didn't get, the people didn't benefit from it. Now, your latest invention, the Dark Plus technology, combines the direct air capture with the natural gas power plant and does it so that it can actually supply energy while also cleaning the atmosphere. Is that, am I understanding this correctly? Uh, as I said, natural gas is the cleanest form of carbon energy. It produces the most energy per CO2 emissions. We can use our technology to clean up its CO2 emissions, use the energy that's left over after generating electricity to do that, as well as to capture CO2 from the air, such that for every kilowatt hour of electricity we produce, it's not like solar, just neutral, no carbon emission. We actually are having a net removal of CO2 from the air, which if we stick underground or stick into products that sequester it, can actually address the threat of climate change. So this natural gas power plant operated in this way with our technology is actually better to address the climate threat than a solar panel on your roof because that is just carbon neutral. It's not taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's certainly not putting anything into it. But our technology that takes CO2 out of the air enables us, if it's powered by this natural gas power plant, to simultaneously produce electricity for people, just like solar does, but at the same time, take a net amount of CO2 out of the atmosphere. And this technology would be energy efficient enough to be cost effective? Electricity generation from any energy source other than, uh, I mean, any fossil energy source where well, you burn things first, is a relatively inefficient process. It's between 30 and 40 percent efficiency. So there's all this 60 to 70, 60 to 70 percent, or 65 percent, left over in, in the form of low temperature heat that doesn't get used, it's thrown away. So you're suggesting that fossil fuels can help clean up the mess they created in the first place. But how are we going to control the bad side effects that actually got us here in the first place? Well, there are certain things on the upstream side of how you, how you, how you discover it or get it out of the ground. So we've got to look at fracking and all the consequences that it does and play, make sure that it's done safely and be very highly regulated. And then there's the, the, transporting it where leakage can be a very big problem. You have to work on that. But once you get it, to the source where you can burn it, then we have a technology that can convert natural gas into a very clean source. You published a paper called REMI, short for Renewable Energy and Materials Economy. Could you explain the details of this proposed economy form? When we thought we were running out of oil to find alternative energy systems, I came up with this idea that if we could mimic nature and get our energy from the sun, and get our hydrogen from water and get our CO2 from the air and then in that sense make like plants do make both the sugar or the energy we needed for life and the materials that grew the plants and the limbs and the leaves that that if we could do the same thing for the human ecology that we'd be in harmony with nature and we'd have something that was sustainable uh, by definition because it was all renewable energy uh, sources, the air, the water, and the sun. And so Mimi just recognized that we now have developed all the technologies necessary to make that happen. And so as renewable energy gets cheaper, one can use it with electrolysis to produce hydrogen. We've developed the technology to take CO2 from the air and can do it at a reasonable cost. And so now we have all the inputs and once you have CO2 and hydrogen, there's nothing you can't make. And you can make fuel, you can make plastics, you can make carbon fiber, you can make, you add, add it to concrete, you can desalinate water, you can grow things. For, I mean, there's lots of applications. So you can have a real economy. As a matter of fact, carbon fiber, in my opinion, 
will be the building material in the 21st century, and we're going to use steel and aluminum very rare, very little at all, uh, replacing that natural resource with carbon fiber. And so there the really is this transition we are making to uh, uh, this RIMI, Renewable Energy and Materials Economy, that's in harmony with nature and allows us to simultaneously provide this 20-fold increase in energy without any environmental damage. It would not be possible to do that if we still required to take the, uh, the natural resources from the ground. It just can't happen. So you're suggesting a whole new industrial ecology. A whole new industrial system. And like previous industrial revolutions in switching from wood to coal to oil to gas, that comes with enormous growth in economic activity and enormous improvement in the lifestyle of and the meeting human needs. And remember we talked about the liability of various energy sources. This energy source is really almost ideal because it's based on air, water, and sun. And that's much more equitably distributed than any of the previous sources. Right. And it creates jobs. And it creates jobs. But then, when thinking about a new industry and infrastructure, cost comes to mind. Who's going to finance all that? Well, you've got to be very careful when you talk about costs. There's something that's called private costs, that's what you pay when you buy it. And then there's social costs that take into account the true overall like environmental costs and social costs that come from adopting a particular technology. There are lots of studies that show already if you make the, take into account the really true cost of our fossil fuel in terms of its environment and health and all the wars it's created, that right now the cost of our technology that is using it to uh, produce electricity and, and liquid fuels via uh, uh, our technology uh, is already lower cost from that point of view. But uh, from a private cost point of view, you might have to pay more at the pump. At this point, whatever the solutions against climate change are, I just wonder if we should still be inhibited by some possible cost factor. What do you think? Well, there are two answers to that. People didn't ask what cost the vaccine would have. And that was the appropriate, I think, response. And uh, because the cost of not having the vaccine was uh, overwhelmed any possible cost it could have. And so I think the same thing is true for climate change. What I think is the right question to ask, and it is a question that society and everybody should ask, what's the best shot we have to addressing the threat of climate change? Or what's the best approaches to vaccine that can save the planet? Those are the ones you should put money into, right? And recognize, no matter what, we, or anything we can do can be made reasonable cost by at large scale and furthermore there's uh, avoiding the, the enormous social and economic damage is it makes every cost any cost worthwhile right in regards to carbon pricing and value um, there are different models for suggesting how to handle carbon pollution or atmosphere or environment pollution um, what would you say which model would work the best B a very important question so I, my partner is an economist who did the carbon market. And so I understand the most important thing, first of all, is you have to put a limit on emissions, right? You got to create a ceiling of emissions, right? Then that basis becomes, uh, and, and, and the approach that I like the best by far was suggested by, at least explained to me by Klaus Lackner. And it goes like this, you have an agency that gives out licenses like we do the radio waves to remove carbon. And you have to pay a, to this agency a fee per ton of carbon that you remove from the earth that's already sequestered. You have a separate agency that gives sequestration credits that says for any CO2 or carbon that's stored underground or stored in products uh, for over 100 years, you can get a certain amount of dollars. Right? And so you just put a gate, when it comes out, of the uh, comes out of the ground, or when it goes back into the ground, those are the two things you have. Anything that goes around that makes no difference, you leave alone, no government interference. You don't worry about 
some of the some of the horrible things that are going now with avoided carbon. Let me give you an example of avoided carbon that's now allowed that's, that would may not work in this situation. So what happens in avoided carbon now is that you can take uh, CO2 that's already sequestered in a dome as a gas, pipeline it to the Permian Basin in Texas, stick it underground to push out enhanced oil, reco uh, oil recovery, and because 50% of that CO2 that you pump down remains in the ground, you get a sequestration credit. Even though it was originally stored underground, all of it was stored underground, and all of it's going to be vented when you burn the gasoline. But that's the sort of things that avoided carbon allows one to do. And yet this, this putting the gates here, in, the, in that case, the person who took it out of the dome would have to pay a tax or a price. Whether you do carbon taxes or carbon markets, that, at least as I know, that's not as important as having a limit and having these very clear rules. Mm -hmm. And who's going to create and implement these new rules and regulations? Would it be some global entity? These agencies should be global in nature and agreements global in nature. But I, I really want to make something very clear. The main thing that has prevented the global agreement till now is the fact that the solutions that people like in the Green New Deal or in the West propose for addressing climate change ignore the energy poverty and the need for the developing countries to meet the energy needs of their citizens. And so there's no way you're going to get a person in that country to say, I'm going to condemn my thing to poverty. Right? And similarly, the energy countries that are developing, they have taken the view, well, you guys have to pay for it because you benefited from putting all the CO2 up in the air. And, and my approach says, look, nobody has to pay for this, right? right? I mean, there's a win-win here, right? If one has, uh, uh, one switches to thinking about it in terms of building a new economy, based on CO2 from the air, renewable energy sources, and using them to produce hydrogen from water. That's much more equitably distributed, right? And one can uh, switch that economy without it being a win-lose situation. Right, win-win is definitely the way to go. But is there any other challenge that you think, besides climate change, that humanity still has to conquer? I think really what people don't appreciate is as big a challenge as we have, to address the threat of climate change, we need, in my calculation, 20 times the energy we had on the turn of the century at 2000. We need that by 2100 in order to uplift the whole world and have the, all have the type of equity we'd like to have. And so we really have to find a way to do this dual challenge. And, and then you know, if you have more energy, all the economic parameters go upward. All the lifestyle, uh, quality of life goes up with energy usage. It's been history. You can just see all the correlations to GDP, to the standard of living, to anything you want. So by finding a way that we can have both more energy, but do it in a way that enables one to, at the same time, address the threat of climate change, I mean, that's just a win-win situation. And the amazing thing is we have the technology to do it. Speaking about time, how are we going to implement all these changes quickly enough to prevent the runaway climate change? Right. So I've written a book that for, 10, for 100 years that I've published, <laughs> but it's called Designing Earthlings. And in it, uh, mm -hmm. it, it really suggests that our species is going to be one rather than competing with each other, that's going to be cooperating with each other and designing the earthlings is we're all one species and designing means we use knowledge to create the future we want. And, and so I really think that cooperation is going to replace competition. And I think that's one of the major uh, transformation that has to occur. And we cooperated to hunt animals and survive when we were, they were much stronger than us and we're going to get back to our, our original roots and cooperate but in this case, instead of being a local village someplace in a tropical jungle, we're going to cooperate at the planetary scale.
We're in the middle of the pandemic right now and it's been teaching us a lot of lessons. Do you believe that there are parallels between climate change and the pandemic? My hope is that the lessons learned from the, uh, the pandemic, I already see it happening, will be said, okay, we have to do the same thing with climate change. What does that mean? We can't wait till we know it's there, right? So if you look, if, if you look what enabled one to meet the pandemic in this and provide a vaccine in eight months, if you really look behind it, there's been research going on and development going on and supply chain and robotic manufacturing that enabled this fast response. And so what we ought to do is begin mobilizing right now to do all the things that are necessary. Think about that someday in the not too distant future, we're gonna have uh, something that's gonna be, have to be rolled out, have all the scale, be able to be global in nature. And that takes, you can't just do that in a day. You gotta start right now to develop that capacity. And it's not only on our technology, it's also on all the supply chain, all the rollouts, all the global uh, agreements that are necessary to make it happen. I agree. Now we know what important role governments and institutions play in the eye of a threat. However, what would you recommend to each single citizen? What can they do on their part to prevent the catastrophic climate change? Well, there's always the uh, f first thing you can do is you can vote for people that, that support acting. Uh, that's in the United States, at least. That's something you can do. Uh, you can uh, certainly uh, 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 protest if the leaders don't do it. There's, I heard a, in one of my classes, a student gave her a report that showed there's some studies that show if 3% of the population is willing to go out and march, then it's then you have a movement that will succeed. And in the last climate march, we had about 2%, 1.5%, right? So we're almost there, right? And I can see that. But we people have got to talk to their neighbors and say, look, and, 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 and organize, spend their, uh, take a little time out from their weekends and everything like that to be part of groups and that will try to uh, uh, mobilize the, the, the bottom up, because in the end, it's the people that will make it happen. There are all these self-interests that are, uh, that are trying to constrain, trying to change. And, and, and so ultimately, if you look at any successful movement, really, and it's the way it should be, actually. It really, you know, I, I believe you get a government you deserve. So if you're not willing to get out in the street to make it happen, then don't get upset if your government doesn't do it. <laughs> Nicely said. And how is your impression of the younger generation? What are your thoughts about the new leaders of tomorrow? Oh, uh, young people are such a <laughs> pleasure at my point of view. They've got such a different orientation about lots of issues, not to mention equity and diversity and, 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 and focusing on social issues. I mean, I used to, I'm a, I'm a teacher at Columbia and you know, throughout the early, the end of the 90s, the early part of 2000, the students were all interested in going to Wall Street, right? But now I hear almost every student I have in my class these days is interested in social entrepreneurship. How can I make a, how can I contribute to improve the social good at the same time I can make money? Everybody's realized that's the most rewarding thing to do, and that's what gives me real hope. And what would you say is the most important tool for tomorrow's leaders? Would it be education? Of course. I mean, education is the necessary thing. And, and of course, behind everything is making sure people have energy available to, to support what they need to do. I really wonder what you see when you look like, let's say, 30 years into the future. <laughs> the rate at which knowledge is changing and the rate at which our lives are changing is really phenomenal. It's one of the part of the problem. It used to be you could wait for generations to die off to have to address new changes. Now it all happening within a single generation. So when you talk about 30 years, 30 years today is like a 200 years or 500 years before. So there are all these things that you can imagine. But I guess the basic thing I will say 
is that I believe as the pandemic, the vaccine for the pandemic is the first example, that people will increasingly understand the, the power that our knowledge has created through our science and, the, and the, that it has given us this capability and, and, and therefore has switched the way we should think about things, not to think about you know, having technology lead what type of life we have, but have it actually help us get the type of life we'd like to have. And I'm, I believe that transformation will occur in the next 30 years. And that is going to be the most profound thing because you'll, you'll see, in my opinion, in 30 years, you'll see global cooperation to create the kind of planet and kind of uh, uh, future we want, which certainly will be uh, one of equity, increased, equ equ me, increased equity and increased uh, availability of energy. Just to clarify, you believe that inequity will be a problem of the past, possibly in the next 30 years. Well, now, as we're recognizing that these problems are global in nature, right? And our village is a global in the village. This is what motivated me when I saw our planet from the moon, uh, my 28th birthday. That's what has me here today, is the impression that made on me, recognizing we're one global community. And so when you take that logic and say, okay, there is nobody else to be against. There is no us and them. And so this continuing, what we've always found is a successful recipe, we're gonna cooperate as a, 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 as a global species, which I happen to call earthlings, and we're gonna find out that when we cooperate, there's nothing we can't do, right? It's amazing the power we've had. I mean, can you imagine, right? <laughs> I, this is hard for me to imagine. Can you imagine nine billion people all educated, all trained, all spending their life figuring out how to be useful and help everybody else. I mean, I mean, it's just unbelievable. What, you know, it's hard to imagine that we can't succeed, right? Uh, it's just, and so there's an enormous potential. Two last questions. Uh, one is, so you really foresee the conflicts between the East and the West, developing countries and developed countries to kind of level out. And the other one is, what would your message in a bottle to the future be? You see, that's all part of this false notion that arose out of the competition uh, or survival of the fittest. I mean, just as a final comment, if you look at the thing that unites all religions, the values that everybody holds shares, it's the golden rule and compassion. Well, the golden rule and compassion, if you practice it, one of the benefits it immediately brings is cooperation. Because you can treat other people like you like to be treated and you have the compassion in order to understand uh, and, and accept the other person. So that is the fundamental tools for building cooperation. So I believe you take science and knowledge and, and our brain and you take compassion and the golden rule and it's, the future is just uh, wonderful. And if you ask me in the bottle uh, what, I, what, I, what I would say uh, <coughs> is I would say, you know, why, why were we dumb so long? Why did it take us so long to understand, as we do when we look back at history in general, why did it take us so long? And the fact is, it did, it does, and but that in the end, I think we're going to be triumph, triumphant, excuse me.